Welcome everybody to today's talk. Uh, Elizabeth Fry, Voice of the Forgotten People, with author and social historian Kate Whitaker. Today's talk is a topic dear to our hearts here at the State Library, and we're grateful for Kate for providing this talk to coincide with the opening of her play Forgotten, starting on Friday, next door at the Playhouse, and running for three nights. We hold a number of books about Elizabeth Fry, including memoirs written by her daughters, and I've provided a few of these on the table here for you to have a look at. The ones on the little table are usually only available in the history room. Now, today's talk is being broadcast as a webinar, and we're pleased to welcome those people who are joining us online today. In due course, this talk will be available on Libraries Tasmania SoundCloud and on Libraries Tasmania's YouTube channel. Now, if you haven't already done so, please switch your phones off now. Now, Kate will take questions at the end of her talk, but before I introduce Kate, I'd like to read to you Libraries Tasmania's acknowledgement of Tasmania's Aboriginal peoples. Libraries Tasmania recognises the deep histories and cultures of the Abor Aboriginal people of Lutrawitta, Tasmania. We acknowledge Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land, waters and sky. We pay respect to the elders past and present who hold the memories, traditions, culture and knowledge of country. And we extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples whose countries were never ceded. Now, Kate is a social historian who specialises in researching women who've been vilified unjustly in their times or had their contribution grossly unstated in order to give them back their rightful place in history. Kate is also an acclaimed, an acclaimed writer of fiction and non-fiction. She was commended in the Society of Women's National Writing Competition for her piece on Elizabeth Fry called The, called the Forgotten Feminist. Kate is also a successful playwright, her play Forgotten, Reliving the Parramatta Female Fic Factory Rebellion, has just completed its second successful se season, sorry, Lassie. just standing <laughs> ovation. Well, the best is there. Too many <laughs> yeah. se Second successful season to standing ovations at the Riverside National Theatre of Parramatta. And it will be performed at the local, at the Hobart Playhouse in next door in a couple of days. Now, uh, please join me in welcoming Kate. Going to there. Thank you very much for inviting me this afternoon. Um, it's uh, it's always strange for me. I've done this talk many times, and I can tell you, I've had a few people who've come up after me and said, uh, "I'm uh, I'm a descendant of Elizabeth Fry." Uh, so um, if somebody is out there today, I'd love to hear them or even on, on the webinars or anything. So um, people know something about Elizabeth Fry, but what they don't know is the enormous contribution she made in terms of changing a whole nation's attitude um, to female prisoners from one of retribution and punishment when they went into prisons to one of reformation and an understanding of, do you want me to lift this up? Yeah. Keep stopping down. Yeah, it doesn't okay. have to be yeah. completely. No, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, um, and uh, some people might know Elizabeth Fry, was a, uh, Elizabeth Fry was a Quaker and Quakers believe in truth and they believe in um, uh, equality, which is what we're going to see too. Okay, so Elizabeth Fry said herself, it's her own words, um, what she did and what her, and she would be the first to acknowledge many, many other women who helped her in this. It was not a question of generosity to help these, um, and she called them uh, our, uh, our unfortunate sisters, our misfortunate sisters. She called them sisters. Um, and she said it was never about generosity. Uh, it was always about justice for them. Um, so we're going to start her life. Um, this is where she was born. Uh, it's called Gurney Court because she was born in uh, 1780 as Elizabeth Gurney. She was always called Betsy. Um, and her father was a wool stapler, so he was a working person. He was not a, a gentleman that uh, had everybody else working for him. Um, he was... Um, uh, he, he sorted the wool qualities out. Uh, but what I'm more interested really is um, 
in this lady, which is her mother. This is Catherine Bell, and she was the um, granddaughter of um, David Barclay. So she was of the Barclay banking uh, uh, family. And David Barclay was the first man to free his slaves in the West Indies. He didn't own a plantation. It came to him by default. So her mother, Catherine, um, was from a very, uh, all Quakers are benevolent. They all have to help the poor. But uh, she was a, a, from a, a family that had set already a milestone for people. Um, and this one I like of a moor. This shows a moor in her home. Um, and Catherine played a, a, a significant part in Elizabeth's life at the beginning. And she said something very important. Um, she said, Christianity is not the op opinion of any man or sect. All right. Not that. So she believed in this relationship with God yourself. So don't try and interfere with us. Um, and that was a very revolutionary thing to say at the time. She called Betsy her dove like Betsy. And Betsy was was not the kind of woman uh, uh, you would have sort of from a child that you would have expected to be the woman she grew to. She was very frightened. She was nervous of the dark. She had a phobia about drowning so she wouldn't get in the bath. Um, and she was very lethargic. So she was quite a frail kid. So she had problems studying uh, for her lessons and things. So this was not the kind of child you'd have picked up and said, this is she's going to do anything remarkable. In fact, her father thought of all of his 13 children. And her mother died, of course, after her 13, 17 years of marriage and 13 children. Um, that she wasn't going to make anything of it. Uh, she moved to this house when she was six because her father then joined uh, uh, in the banking side, side of the family. And her uh, uh, diaries, which we're grateful to her two oldest daughters, they were put together within a year. Sorry, excuse me, within a year of her dying. So the contemporary. Um, and um, so her life was one of what we call a gay Quaker. So she had all the trimmings of any wealthy um, daughter of a, a wealthy businessman. Um, and uh, so she lived here. She moved here when she was six. And her mother died sadly when she was 12. But we find her at 17 with her diaries reading like Jane Austen. And actually, Jane Franklin's diaries at that age read like Jane Austen too. And this is Prince William, and all her diaries are full of dancing with the prince who's coming. And obviously, being a wealthy family, they entertained this man. And of course, now we're talking about uh, Betsy was born in 1880. So we're talking about 18, uh, sorry, 1780. And we're now talking about 1797. So we're well into the French Revolution now. And, and, and um, uh, well, we're moving into that. So we've, we've got a lot of soldiers around. And uh, Betsy, um, something happens to her. This is her uh, friend and society where they went on a Sunday. And Betsy was the most fidgeting child. She hated it. This is not somebody we think. We, we, she has this image of being this rather stout, um, good good doer, you know, uh, and, and she was. But she wasn't this person that sort of found her religion easy. If you read her diary, she's, she's tormented by what she should be doing. And there's a guy who comes here called William Savory, and he talks about freeing the slaves. He's just been on a tour. He's a preacher. Um, and her sister turned around, and to a shock, she sees Betsy weeping. So Betsy decides she's going to do the right thing. And William Savory puts in his diaries, she never will. She'll never give up this gay life. And sure enough, she says herself within a very short time that she, you know, she rode into town in her on her little pony uh, um, and in her and she had scarlet boots with purple laces uh, full of heaven, thoughts of heaven. And then all the um, officers started flirting with her and she rode home full of the world. And, and that was about it. But what happened to her is that she um, first of all, she went and did which is all what they do, 17 and 18, did the season in London. And something very strange was different about her. She had a chaperone called Amelia Opie. 
Now, Amelia Opie's name was the first name on the first ever female um, petition to Parliament. And it was against not the slave trade, which Mr Wilberforce picked up, much stronger than that, against slavery. So off she goes after, after her season, and she hasn't gotten a proposal, which is what they're there in London to do, to Colebrookdale. And she meets somebody called Deborah Darby. And Deborah Darby is a female um, preacher. And the preachers in the Quaker society were totally equal for women and men. And Deborah Darby says a very interesting thing to her. She says, be a voice for the voiceless. Be a light to the blind, speech to the dumb, and a friend to the lame. This is in 1798. She's only 18. She rushes home. She overnight becomes a plain Quaker. So she dons the Quaker, and, and her sister and brother think she's nuts. All right, they do. And she opens a school, and she's got a big school. She's got a lot of kids in this school. She's got 80 kids in this school. And she's got a school for girls, which is really important because you don't educate girls. Uh, and she puts in the diary that even though she's become a plain Quaker, you know, she's, she, she's seeing a friend come towards her because now she these and those people. She ran around the other corner because she was too embarrassed to speak to them. So this is, this is a torment that she's doing all the way through. Um, and um, while she's at Derby, she meets uh, one of the Fries, and they're all cousins. So um, I'll just uh, wait a minute. So she goes back, and she's got, you know, I've got this mission for the for the school for for what I want to do with life. And this young man called Joseph Fry pops up, and he wants to marry her. And she says, No, 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 I, I I've I've got my mission now. I know what my mission is. Um, and uh, but she said, but if you come back again and I feel nice towards you, well, maybe. Um, so he does come back and she does feel quite nice. And she says, I'll marry you, providing you do not interfere with my work when I think God has called me. So he says, no, of course not. Now, he must have been laughing up, up his sleeve because he knew what was going to happen. So sure enough, five children later, eight years of marriage, she writes in her diary, it has been different to what I expected. Instead of becoming a useful instrument in the church militant, I am a careworn wife and mother. But what she does do at this time is she does set up a school for poor children. But she reads a very important book by Joseph Lancaster that talks about the monitor system. And we're going to see that come in to her work. And... Um, and the life goes on, and but almost a year after that, her father dies. And for the first time, she openly prays at his grave. And then she openly prays in the friend's house. And of course, she's made a preacher. Now, at the time, she wouldn't know that this is going to be a huge benefit to her in terms of her reformation of prisons, because she's going to do reaching tours. Okay. So the first time we see her go to, and this is Newgate, and thank God it's gone. It has, because it's now an extension. Where it was, it's an extension of the Old Bailey. So she finds herself there. Um, and um, in 1813, so she's been married 13 years. She's eight children now. And she goes with her, uh, her brother-in-law and um and she's horrified by the state of the women. She's absolutely horrified. They're semi-naked. Rushes home, gets the whole family making clothes, sends medicine for the children. Um, and then a year later, she's asked to go again to Newgate. Um, and so this is Newgate, and it looks like they're all having a lot of fun there, doesn't it, outside? So this is what they've come to see. And she's asked to uh, administer to a young, young girl who, in a panic, having had an illig illegitimate child, kills the child. And she says how absolutely, uh, dreadfully awful to take this young woman's life to. Um, and then something very sad happens in her own life. Her little daughter, Betsy, dies at the age of four. And... Strangely, also, her husband's business is not going very well. 
And so the older family members, and she's one of 13, remember, they all take the older children from her and leave her with the youngest three. But in 1816, that Christmas, they don't go out to their family home, the, the sort of the country home. They stay in London. And we don't know why, but she suddenly decides to go down on Christmas Day, asked to be locked in on her own with the women, and she just starts reading from the Bible to them. And then she starts talking to them about the children. And what is the wonderful thing about these women? And we see it later because Maria Edgeworth, who was a far more successful writer than Jane Austen, she goes to see these women later when um, Elizabeth's been doing her work with them. And she is astonished at what good mothers they are. I remind you of that because, remember, they were ripped away from their children. What good mothers mothers they were so Betsy clearly sees that because she decides she offers to open a school for the children and the women are crying with joy and 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 can't and, and also she and then she's got to go and talk to these authorities there's no room in this prison it's overcrowded so she gets herself a tiny little room but interesting Betsy says when I was a child if I was asked, I would do it. If I was bid, I would not. With these women, this is exactly how she works with them. So they ask to choose the teacher. Now, this is a huge risk because <laughs> she's got this school. And if they chose the wrong teacher, she'd be laughed at and it'd be finished. And they choose a lovely woman. And I love to name these people Mary Connor. She's a wonderful, wonderful teacher. She gets a pardon for it and she dies of consumption before she gets released. Um, but then Elizabeth Fry, and this is the other most important thing, she realises you can't do this on your own, you must have a group of women with you. Here's young um, Mary Sanderson and she's only 17 and obviously these are done afterwards from stories, they're created. And she tells us, so she goes in now to help uh, Elizabeth Fry, because she realizes she can't do this on her own. And Elizabeth's 10th child now, she has 10 children at this stage. Um, so she goes in with Mary Sanderson, and Mary Sanderson says, I well remember shuddering when the door closed upon us and we were locked in. They were told to leave the watches at home. They didn't. But what is interesting is these women because they were going in every day to visit and make sure the school was running, they built this great bridge with the women. And the women trusted them enough to come on. And it's the women that asked for this, because sometimes there's a sense here that this factory system was Mrs. Fry's and it was her responsibility that these women were working. Absolutely the opposite. The women came to them and said, teach us skills. We want to earn some money. We want to learn some skills. It was their idea, not hers. So what she does is she gets her little committee of 12 ladies, and I love what she calls it. The ladies, so this is in 1817, the Ladies Association for the Improvement of Female Prisoners. Now, there's a, two ways of in, interpreting improvement. They, she knew they'd all think, oh, they're trying to make them better people. But she meant improving their skills and improving their lot. That's what she was after. But what she did, and this is this is just astonishing. And here she is, and she's you can see how frail she is in this shot. You know, we see her as this sort of much older lady, but uh, um, she is frail and uh, in in a body. And this is a lovely, lovely portrait of her. Um, and um, so I, I like to show it in terms of um, that this was not a strong woman. This does not look a strong woman, but she was in a way. What she does, and she does the most remarkable system here, and this is why it's so important to us when we look at the factory system in uh, uh, Tasmania and in um, New South Wales. She gets all the women together and they all decide a modus operandi for this factory. They all do, okay? So they decide they're gonna split the women into groups of 12 and they're going to put a monitor in charge. But the women want to choose the monitor. Fair enough. 
But what Lisbeth Fry does very cleverly is she classifies the groups. So the ones that are very vulnerable and things, she keeps them together, the ones that things, and then where she gets the women that obviously been uh, returned a few times, and this is not because she gives up on them, because she doesn't. In fact, these lovely case studies of these women they work with and how they turn their lives around and, and, and you know, so, but the whole idea was to try and get some kind of classification. And we do have that theme of hers going through, not in any way to be cruel, but just in a way of trying to help the different groups at where they were at in their life. So they have a monitor, they work out the hours of the, the, they're going to work, they work out how much they're going to get paid every week, and they agree to put so much away for when they leave. And that's really important because the night the women left for the boats, and it was a night where they used to smash everything up, Mrs. Fry and the ladies used to sit with them because they were really upset. But there were women who were staying would say, give them my money. And these women had nothing. Give them my money. They'll need it more than me. Okay. So this system is set up. And then we come to this wonderful situation. Who's going to be in charge? A matron. Oh, no, no. Women haven't got brains to be managers. That's what they, they all said. No, 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 no. The superintendent is in charge. We saw all the men on the other side of that gate, didn't we? No, no, no. Yes. We'll prove it to you. We'll pay half her salary if you trust us to get this matron in. And they did. And it worked. And overnight, every single man was taken out of that prison. Some of those women were safer in that prison than they were at home, I'm sorry to say, but they were. So overnight, there were no women. Now, the matron that's in the factory at Cascades or the matron that's in at Paramount, there would not have been a matron if it hadn't have been for Elizabeth Fry, proving that women could do that job. And women know women, that's what she kept saying. And also the all the sexual abuse that went with it and the terrible abuse went out with those men. So those women were very, very safe in that area. Okay, so then, so that's the list of the things she did. 12 people, classification, learning skills and the skills they learned were sewing and knitting, had a payment, all the rules they had to agree to. They all put their hands up in the end and agreed to the rules. Okay, if I, I will do something if I masked it. They asked it. Okay, and of course, all these people in charge said, well, this is just a joke. They'll steal all the stuff they're sewing. So Lydia Irving was the woman who got Dixon & Co, who made clothes coming out to New South Wales to let them make the clothes. 18 months later, 20,000 garments later, three went missing. Can you see she's totally changing people's attitudes to these women all the time? To prove this, of course, then the Lord Mayor, because they're very pleased now, because they've got this successful, you know, so they want everybody to see it. And she doesn't want people to come in and see it. And she works out, if I do, then I've got a chance of spreading this news to other prisons. So on a Friday, and you can see the little vouchers that signed by Elizabeth Fry only, so she signed every voucher to allow them to come in. This is not a true representation because the women did not sit separate to the women, they sat with them and they sat on the front row and on the front row were all the women condemned to die. And she sat them there with their children and every time she prayed for them, she prayed for mercy, she prayed for a, a society, a Christian society that would remove capital punishment um, and she would remind everybody that we are all sinners um, so the one person that came to see her that was really important was a, a man called Robert Owen. And Robert Owen was our first socialist, probably. Uh, and he had a mill in uh, Lanarkshire. And what he did was he wrote an article about this. And, this, and we're only talking about four months in here, four or five months in from starting this. Um, and then he sends 50,000 leaflets all over England to all the places where they've all got prisons. Overnight, she becomes a celebrity. She doesn't want it, 
But when she goes preaching, every prison is open to her. And not only that, all the women come and meet her and say, can we do what you're doing in Newgate in our prison? So he, it, it was astonishing. She didn't want this, but it actually was necessary in terms of changing a whole nation's attitude. But you might be interested to know that one woman came to see her in 1824, Jane Franklin, before she married John. Tall, majestic looking woman, and we'd seen that. Very fair, golden hair, light gray eyes, expression of great sweetness and mildness. The bell rang, the prisoners brought in. Almost all strapping ugly women with the most low life air and impudent expression of countenance. But wait for this. Their manners, however, during the time they remained in the room were perfectly quiet and orderly. They were all dressed in the same plain costume. Remember, that's why she got uniforms here, because those women did not have clothes. It wasn't to regiment them or make them look stupid or to put them down. It was because the whole idea was for them to save what clothes they had for when they left the prison. Okay, so they were all in the same clothes. She read the Bible, made a few comments, and then a psalm and a few comments, then dismissed them. I was convinced that she must have used at other times much more effectual methods in order to have them as decent and well behaved as we saw. But then we see these lovely letters between Jane later and Elizabeth Fry in trying to work out methods that would help the women here. And Mrs. Fry says very complimentary things I, I, about Jane Franklin to, to John Franklin about this. So at this time, she's, she's not married John, she's early 30s, and, and also she'd been to go and look at the hulks and the prisons on the hulks. So this is a very inquisitive woman, okay? So on one of her tours around, she goes and stays at this house, which is Lord Derby's, uh, Earl of Derby's home. And uh, this is uh, 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 Elizabeth Fry. And she says, and this just shows you, she's in their beautiful ballroom, drawing room, and then she gets on her knees and says she'd like to pray. And of course, they'll get on with her. And then she says, well, I'd like, you know, everybody here. So, of course, I bring in the family. And she says, no, everybody. So in come these scullery maids who've never been up those stairs, let alone. And they all pray with her. But what she doesn't know is that the son, the eldest son there, Lord, Lord Stanley, is going to be the colonial secretary. He doesn't know that. And when she makes her, oh, I'll just go back a minute. Um, when she decides to create this National Society of uh, the Organization for the Promoting of the Reformation of Female Prisoners in 1822, it's the first female national organization ever. And it's all great, you know, I've done a bit of business and it's got the best quality control and it, outlist, it outlived her 60 years. It was that well-organized organization. So somebody called her a genius and she was in terms of that. And not only that, um, she then tells these ladies who are visiting, when you go visiting, you must go in twos and you are there not only to help these women, but to stop abuse going on rotting going on. Now, I don't know if some of you have read Lucy uh, Frost's lovely book at the moment on um, um, uh, uh, convict orphans, and she talks about the terrible rotting that went on at the orphanage, about the food being... So it's happening all the time, and Elizabeth Fry knows that. But these women not only have to be independent of the organisation, they have to find a patroness in their area, some lady so-and-so, they'd better because if somebody tries to shut them up, she will have authority. So who does Elizabeth Fry find to run to be her patroness of the whole of her national society? Well, you know the handsome prince, his wife, and who was his wife? George III's daughter. So if you want to get a, your head above the politicians, who are all desperate to get a knighthood or a baronessy or anything, even if they're titled themselves, you get to the royal family. 
And that was an amazing structure of power that she used. But then, so we, 1817, she's doing this. 1818, she turns herself straight to the boat. These convict boats. Now, some of these boats are sitting in the harbour for three months. So she develops a subcommittee. And we know that the Raja Quilt is dedicated to the ship's committee. And it's Mrs. Fry's ship's committee. Okay. These women, and particularly the wonderful Elizabeth Pryor, would be on those ships till they sailed. And she would make a note of every single woman who came there, if they were heavily ironed or ironed at all, if they had no clothes on or their clothes were thing, or if their children had been taken away from them under the age of eight. And every single night she went past Westminster and left her report for the Home Secretary saying, fix it. Every single night, be a voice for the voice. Who else is going to do this for them if it's not these women? So utterly dedicated. And then the other thing they tried to do, so they started the school just like they did in the prison, school for the children, and then to get them sewing and learn skills, he came up with this brilliant idea of giving them a bag of bits of material. And what they did was they did the same system of 12 women, but this time there were two lots of 12 women under a mess woman. The mess woman was from Newgate, so they knew she was reliable, but they also knew she could sew. So the whole idea was to teach these women on the way over because they all had this bag and, and needles and all this thing. And it cost those women 26 pounds, 10 shillings, because they had to pay for these bags every time a boat went out of their own money. So committed were they to learn skills. Um, so this was, and, and that's where obviously Kasaya Hayter decided to use that and this wonderful, wonderful Raja quilt that they made. Um, but, the one thing that she wanted, of course, uh, and, uh, and and this is, uh, so Elizabeth Fry went out every, before every boat sailed, she went, just before it sailed. And she would, and we have, we have lovely records of uh, Admiral Young's daughter watching her go around, talking to the women, any that were upset, she'd stay longer with them, trying to give them courage. And then she would pray with them. And it was always this psalm that said, I called with you on your way in my distress, and he answered my call. He set me free from my chains. He brought me safe into a harbour. Um, and so, again, these are, these are creative pictures. Um, and remember, this is a woman who's petrified of drowning. Well, she had to go out on those little boats to get to those boats to see those women. And there's a story of her getting caught in a squally situation and being bobbed up and down like a cork. It's another one again of a preaching, and but most of the time they were down underneath. Okay, but this is Kasaya Hater. It took from 1817 to 1839 to get a matron on these boats. And the abuse that went on in these boats is horrendous. And Elizabeth Fry tried her very best to stop it by talking to people who were free passengers on the boat and asking them to report back to her. So if you've got a missionary going out, that was great. Um, and when she was giving evidence at the Select Committee uh, for Parliament, she insisted the issues of the boats be brought up. And then she gave a detailed account with witnesses on the friendship. On the friendship, um, the women were stripped naked to, to the waist and whipped openly. Uh, on the friendship, they were given a wooden collar such that one young woman, when it came to do it again, she jumped and ran overboard. Normally, they would down sails, put a boat out. They didn't. They just kept going. Um, and then the keys to the where the, the grates, where the women were, were left open for the crew to grab, including the officers. Uh, and all the, all the captains said, let me, don't let me see it. And then some of these women were, when they got to St. Helena, they were rowed across to the British fleet for comfort women, for the officers, and rowed back onto that boat. 
Elizabeth Fry knew all this. She arguments going on with the Admiralty that you know this is que- this is this is this is Crown property. Anybody who touches Crown property on boats is supposed to face serious offences. These women are Crown property. Um, so after all this time, 21, 22 years, she gets a matron. Kasaya and there's uh, on a couple of the other boats. Lovely Kasaya, what does she do? She falls in love with the captain. Not what Mrs. Fry wanted. Okay. Uh, so Mrs. Fry after that had two matrons on the boat and she made it very clear, please do not fraternize with the crew. Okay. Um, I mean, they were still very, very good friends. Uh, um, and, and obviously she was a, a very, very young woman. Um, so this is the Raja, which is famous, obviously, for the the Raja quilt. Um, and um, uh, my second play, which you may have got some notices on, is on Jane Franklin and the Raja quilt, because I'm absolutely fascinated what happens to women when they quilt and how it soothes them. And, and, and they often do it in times of trauma and sorrow. Um, so now we come to what does this mean to us in terms of our, um, our systems of factories? Well, the factory system in the Parramatta Female Factory, which is there, the big building, and the penitentiary, Uh, first female hospital there. 22 out of 24 babies died in that hospital in one year. And starving mothers, three children too small to survive. What did the surgeons say? Oh, the women are smothering them. What did Jane Franklin say when she saw the same statistic when she came over here? This is the most appalling thing I've ever seen. Get them out of that damp place, put them in the town different attitude towards these women. Why are these women treated like this uh, and, and assumed the worst possible things that happen to them, uh, that, that they do? Okay, so what happened here at this penitentiary in 1827, which is what Forgotten is about? Because nobody was keeping an eye or visiting or doing the kind of system that Mrs. Fry had written to all the governors and all the governor's wives to do, was not happening. Nobody was watching or keeping an eye, and it's thought these matron's son was stealing the food. So in 1826, a woman, and it must have been bad because they had to own up to it, a woman died of starvation. It is the duty of the governor to feed them. Mrs. Fry went on and on and on about the duty of care, such that she got a jails act passed in 1828, where there were inspectors to go into those jails. Nobody had ever heard of such a thing before, okay? The woman died, Governor Darling, who much preferred military rule to anything else, decided, all right, he set up a committee, and he put, and of course, Reverend Marsden was always putting his hand up for everything, even though he didn't do anything very well. Puts his hand up and he's gonna be the, 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 um, the chairman, and then, Eliza Darling, and she comes from a, a grandmother who was quite philanthropic, who knew Hannah Moore, who was a, a great benevolent woman. Uh, yes, she'll have a committee, a ladies' committee, but she was over there, always on a day bed, peri, perinatal or postnatal. She never got off it. Um, so who's who's going to who's going to do this? Oh, Mrs. Marsden puts her hand up. What is she going to tell Mr. Marsden? That there's something wrong? Or are these girls going to tell this man when, when they know this Mrs. Martin? So this is not at arm's length. The whole idea is these women who come in are at arm's length from the organisation so they can be truthful about what's happening. Uh, then the following year, Eliza... Um, I can't remember. Sorry, sorry, I'll come in a minute. Uh, so if I don't think about names, I've had so many children through me or, or teenagers through me, I must have 50,000 names I've had to remember, but it'll come back. Um, and so another woman died. So these women in this factory decided we're all going to die here if we don't do something about it. So they all went on strike, the first strike ever in a factory, because that's the first purposeful factory. 
and that put them in the penitentiary here. You can see the little circular, and, and so they didn't have windows, they had a circular vent. So they were in this yard here, in the penitentiary, um, and they were breaking up stones. You didn't break up stones here, they did over there. It was the most horrendous thing to ask women to do, and it only stopped in 1838 when the Sisters of Charity came and said, this is outrageous, this is what men do. This must stop. But the good thing was, they had some stones. So they got in the factory, and the matron changed overnight. But the matron cut their two too, so their decision was, the only way we're going to stop this is to break out. 220 got out ran through the town they were fired on with bullets and that's against the law but darling allowed that they were chased with bayonets and they got to the town and as charles wentworth said in his newspaper one word on their lips starvation this is one of the few female rebellions we have in history and rebellions don't have to overthrow governments rebellions have to be a mass stand against your government so that's what forgotten is all about and that's what we celebrate because this was purposely wiped from our history. But it, governor didn't, the governor, darling, didn't last. He, he didn't get his contract renewed. What does this then mean? Sorry. So this is the penitentiary, as it is now. Uh, and you can see the little vents at the top. And that's what they were like at the bottom, too. It's a very hot, um, very uh, stuffy in there. So this is what I've got of Cascades originally, okay, and it was built, obviously, um, by um, Arthur, um, and you can see how um, really tight it was in terms of lack of space. Um, so again, Elizabeth, uh, they decided, so there's, uh, there's actually a, a statement here, when Cascades was built, we sincerely hope that the same line of industry will be adopted as observed in Millbank female penitentiary. So after Mrs. Fry had finished with Newgate, they went on to Millbank to introduce these skills. In getting up needlework of all description upon a moderate scale, thereby accumulating, wait for this, accumulating a fund which would defray the expense of the establishment. And at the same time, to provide for the deserving and reformed females. So we're talking about reform, reformation now. They're supposed to be irreformable, irredeemable. Taken of encouragement to future good conduct in the shape of some useful article of wearing apparel or a portion of their earnings to be presented to them on quitting the factory. The Parramatta female factory made a huge profit. They got a penny a shirt, whereas they charged the people eight pence a shirt. Jane Franklin got them half of what they got from it when here. So if they were getting eight pence, she was giving them four pence for whatever they were doing here. Um, but obviously, from Mrs. Price's point of view, and when Jane writes to her, you can see the desperation. Look, I'm trying. And, and Jane Franklin was probably the only governor's wife that visited regularly the factory. In fact, when she went over to Parramatta and she said to Lady Gibbs, I want to go to the factory, she said, oh, no, no, they'll kill you. They'll kill. She said, no, no, no. She said, they're trying to keep me away from here, but they will not keep me away. So she was a, one of the few women that genuinely kept an eye on you. You didn't have any starvation here that I know of under her. So she listened to Mrs. Fry's idea of space, and she herself, because she was the first woman to win the National Geographic Prize, was Jane Franklin. So she had great understanding of the environment and what the environment means. So obviously she knew there needed to be an extension here or something. So Mrs. Fry suggested that she looked at, and I think it was called, I'm sure I've got notes, it was called Bricklands before it was called Brickfields here. Um, that they'd build this big space area to be able to classify the women then. But the great thing that Mrs. Fry wanted, and Jane Franklin believed in it, six months to learn skills. At whose expense? The government's. The government is setting up a school. She used this system to make sure that the government set up like an industrial school. At their expense, feeding them, clothing them, 
giving them somewhere, place, warm to eat and teaching them a skill. Brilliant idea. And Jane Franklin went with it. And unfortunately, it dropped apart because she was removed. Okay, and the Wilmot was not interested in this. Okay, but this was the ultimate for Mrs. Fry, that in the end, these women would have such skills that it would help them stand on their own two feet. And many of them did, we know that. They ran businesses here. They ran farms here. You know, they, they were pioneer women. They, these women were not like British women. These were very, very different women. And it's no wonder that, you know, Australia was the first country that let women stand for parliament because these women that were the backbone. And, and it was Mrs. Fry's view that, first of all, they sh she could teach them and they could change because they learned these skills. But it was Mrs. Fry's idea that they learned them at the government expense. So um, just make sure I missed it. So um, what does Mrs. Fry, what does uh, Jane Franklin say about the assignment system? And the whole idea was to get rid of the assignment system because it was the most appalling abuse that you can imagine. So she says about, and she writes a letter to Mrs. Fry in 1941, Hopeless situation, assignment open to all temptations of licentiousness. And, she's, and, and she was the one who obviously was the first woman to set up a committee for the women to speak for themselves against assignment. First ever allowed women to open their mouths here, the convict women, to be listened to. They weren't listened to in the courts or anywhere else. And it was Macanotchi's report that got assignment supported by Jane at that time, that obviously there was an issue about a husband in the end, um, to get that assignment system finished. Jane, Fry, uh, Jane, Jane um, Franklin and Mrs. Fry desperately sought to get deportation removed too. This is deport, it's not transportation. These women were never going back. Mrs. Fry knew that. She was horrified that they'd gone from 1817, two boats, to five a year, just going out from England, let alone all the ones going out from Ireland. So she said, and quite rightly, this is not about space in the prisons now. This is about populating a colony. She knew exactly what was going on. And, and so did obviously Jane. And, and when obviously they stopped in New South Wales and they all poured in to here, it was just a nightmare for them. Um, so Elizabeth Fry, um, she died in 1845. Um, and her daughters said um, she had died of utter exhaustion for these women, helping these women right to the end. And it wasn't just these women. She continued to write letters. And every time she wrote a letter, she would say, if there are any girls from Newgate, send them our love. That's what she did. And that's what Jane Franklin did not understand, that it was not just what, Jay, what uh, Mrs. Fry did, it was that the, she loved those girls and she saw goodness in those girls. And Jane Franklin was a statistician and she wanted to marry a scientist and she was working all the jigsaw bits right, but she'd missed the most important point, which Kasaya was trying to tell her. We need to pray with these girls. We need to read from the Bible with these girls. We need to show them how much we love them. But Jane Franklin said very clearly, these, girl, these women for whom no man careth, how I'd give my life to serve them if only they made me the colonial secretary. All right, I think that's about it. Are there any, any questions? Yeah. You mentioned that Elizabeth Fry would report back on um, mothers who had had children under the age of eight. Taken from taken them. From them. Did that mean that the children under the age of eight were expected to be transported? Yes, could come with them. Could come with them. Could come with, could them, come with them. Someone else. No, could come with them if they wanted to. So, and in fact, there is evidence of some women fought to get three children with them. There is, we have evidence of one woman. And so they, the issue was nobody was ever monitoring what was happening to these women, except. 
that's why these women visiting were so important. And, it, and, and that's why Mrs. Fry needed a group of women, because one person might get sick or something, and they always had to be in twos. So whatever they saw, they had a witness to what they saw. Um, so yes, they were allowed under eight to bring the children. Um, but obviously the greatest tragedy was, was uh, the loss of those children at home. And, um, and obviously that when they got them here, they were taken away. That would not have been allowed in England. That would not have been, there was no law in England that allowed you to take children away from their, their mothers or parents. So, um, and I mean, to me, the, the most horrendous thing for me is that the first person who did this was King, Governor King in 1802. And he took these girls away. They said they weren't safe. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Governor King, but when he came out on the first fleet, he became the governor of uh, Norfolk Island. So he chose the men he was going to take and the convict women. And he had the convict women like you. And he told them all off and he said, don't you live with these men? Don't you fraternize? If you want to be with this man, you come. I will marry you. And then when you go back, we'll get a priest to marry you. His housekeeper, Aunt Innett, had two children by him within two and a half years. So if the governor does that, what chance of any other of these women when they were out there of safety? And this was a man who's telling the women, and this is a man who's taking children away from these women that are not fit. So Norfolk Island was regarded as this wonderful place where you go and you can have a choice of all these women and nobody will notice. So, you know, for me, it's an honour. And, and Elizabeth Fry said that when anybody asked her about... Um, why she did this. She said it was an absolute honour and a privilege to work with these women. And for me, it's an honour to try and bring these stories out now and to change people's attitudes uh, and to understand what a remarkably strong, we, and some weren't. In my play, I show the alternative when they're not strong. And that's a tragedy too. Um, but um, I think we should be incredibly proud. And one of the reasons I'm writing the radical, I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to mince my words here. Uh, at the end of that play, it says this quilt belongs to Tasmania. It's Tasmania's icon. It should be always shown here. This is the women's spirits went into that quilt. It should not be hidden away, which is in a drawer for nearly all the year in the National Gallery. What is the point of that? So we might even look at getting a petition up to try and push for that, because this quilt is a wonderful, wonderful uh, evidence of these women's their hopes, their abilities to get together and work as sisters. They had surrogate sisters that saved them, thank goodness. But we should be so proud of them. Yeah, sorry. I keep preaching, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's when we look at that, but in that particular convict voyage where women brought their children with them, that the women with the children were the most were the best behaved yes. on the voyage, that they helped the other sick women. That's right. And it was like they did everything they could to be good mothers when they were on a boat. Absolutely. And keep those children with them. Yeah. As soon as they got here, the they children not, with them. And that was the most appalling thing to do, to take them just so they could go, uh, you know, and, and, and one of the things that Lucy Frost has done this wonderful job, and when I go back, I'll put the other hat on as a social historian, because I intend to find the many children that died on the Parramatta Female Factory site, over 100 in one year, all under three. So this is an awful thing. But before I finish, I just because. oops, I asked Liz to get this out for me because this um, this biography of Jane Franklin and it's here, isn't it, in the library? And I was so pleased to see it by Francis Francis Woodward. It's a brilliant biography of her, and they uh, and Francis um, got um, to talk to the family of Jane Franklin, so all the descendants could give her those anecdotes. But she went through 2,000 documents, and, uh, sorry, 2,000 letters and 200 documents, including a diary. And she captures the young Jane wonderfully before she tells them this other story. So it's an absolutely fabulous biography of, of Jane Franklin. I can highly recommend that. So I, I've got it because obviously it's out of print, but I'm so pleased. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I'll <laughs> yeah. So I just want to thank you all for coming. And if you will come and support us, we'd love that. I, I am leading a young group of uh, drama graduates. They've had a terrible three years in COVID where they've earned next to nothing. 
Uh, we have not got a big producer behind us. We have no government funding. Literally, I'm putting the money up for them to come. And they are taking the takings, which will help to some extent to put to repay some of the many, many hours that they put in for rehearsals. But they are passionate about this story, passionate about everybody knowing about Forgotten. Uh, and uh, so if you can support us and um, what I've done, and I'm not requesting this sometimes, but what I have done this last year, because I've missed three years of going to the theatre. I can't go to a theatre, but I'm not talking about the big ones. <clears throat> I can't go to some of these theatres. I just buy a ticket just to support them, because I think I've saved three years of not buying tickets, quite frankly, so I just buy one. And sometimes I go, and if I'm going, I, I might even buy one for myself and one for a bit of help, because they desperately need it. So if you could support us, that would be absolutely wonderful. All right? Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me. Oh, yes, I should, I should just finish off this, of course. I should, so... That's... That's Jane, of course. And look how, how 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 troubled she looks. There, you can see the strain on her face. Uh, it's a bit surprised that we all know. Finally, in 2008, they got a statue of her. It was all that time. But so I'll be going over when I go over there to put uh, some some Australian flowers there uh, to thank her for all the work she's done with the Australian group. Okay. So, so that's the last one. She was on the five pounds up. She'd have loved that with all the girls. <laughs> Thank you. Excuse me. Can I just have a change?